Welcome, everyone. This is the first event of the Healthcare Professionals Genomics Education Week, um, supported by the National Human Genome Research Institute and the Inter-Society Coordinating Committee for Practitioner Education in Genomics. Um, my name is Tracy Weiler, and uh, the session that we are delivering today is entitled Direct-to-Consumer Genetic Testing, Updates, and Cases. And this is um, with a group of individuals who are members of the Direct-to-Consumer Genetic Testing Project group. So the learning objectives for our session today are to describe the current direct-to-consumer genetic testing or DTCGT landscape and to apply DTCGT results to a patient scenario with the following types of results, disease risk results, carrier risk results, and pharmacogenomics results. If you have any questions throughout the session, you are welcome to use the Q&A button on your, um, on your Zoom. And we have a couple of panelists here today who will be answering the questions in the, in the Q&A um, via text, or um, also um, we might be able to answer them live um, later on during the session. The session is going to run from 12 to 1 Eastern time. Uh, I know we have people from around the world, so you may be in a different time zone. I'm sure many of you are. Uh, we will be staying on the call for another 30 minutes or so beyond the hour uh, if people have additional questions that they would like answered. Okay, our panelists today are all members, as I said, at the DTCGT project group of ISCC PEG. We have clinical geneticists and genetic counselors and pharmacy, um, PharmD people and um, PAs and um, medical, medical school um, educators as well. So we have a wide swath of expertise here um, today. None of us have any financial disclosures um, at all. And just to give you a brief uh, overview of the ISCC PEG, you can go to this website, genome.gov slash ISCC, to find out more information about um, the, the ISCC PEG in general and the Direct-to-Consumer Genetic Testing Working Group. The last thing I wanted to say before I turn the um, the the mic over to uh, our next presenter is that there is a direct-to-consumer genetic testing FAQ for healthcare professionals. So if you go to genome.gov and just look for the DTCGT FAQ, you can find a whole bunch of information about, um, about DTC in um, healthcare um, practice. And on that note, I am... Oh, all of a sudden, my my mic is or my slides are going backwards. Um, the last thing I wanted to say before I turn the mic over is that we do appreciate your feedback on this um, on this event on this webinar, and there is a, a QR code here. And if you have if you leave the the call early and leave the Zoom early, this will appear, and we would really appreciate your feedback. On, on this um, presentation. It will also, um, doesn't matter when you leave the, the webinar, you will get this link. And so let's start with an introduction of direct-to-consumer genetic testing. When Park is uh, a, a, a physician associate uh, and she will lead us off. Good afternoon, everyone. And um, I'm really excited to be here with you. Um, my name is Dr. Wynn Park. I'm um, the president and founder of the Society of PAs in Genetics and Genomics. And um, we're gonna talk about genetic testing models. So genetic testing can be a little confusing for people. Um, it's easy to break things down though, if you look at the different types of testing um, and if you look at um, different factors. Uh, specifically, who's ordering the test, looking at how consent is obtained, how the results are given, and then how the results can be clinically applied. So we'll start with clinic-based genetic testing. 
And that one's pretty straightforward. That one is a test that is ordered by a healthcare professional. Um, and because of that, the healthcare professional obtains, absent, uh, obtains consent, excuse me. Um, and then the results come to the healthcare professional, which allows them to integrate it directly into the clinical care of the patient. And those results can be used clinically. Um, there's kind of an intermediate category um, that is a consumer initiated but provider mediated category in which um, the consumer um, orders the test, but um, it's and sometimes it's done through um, a, a commercial company, um, but there is a healthcare professional who's employed by that lab and they sign off on the test. Um, consent is usually obtained directly um, from the consumer, sometimes with, um, sometimes without um, the healthcare professional assisting with that. And then the result gets sent directly to the consumer, um, which sometimes they may have optional access to a healthcare professional afterwards. Um, and oftentimes those results can be used clinically as well. Um, what we'll be talking about today, though, are direct consumer genetic tests. Um, in these cases, a healthcare professional is not involved. The consumer orders the test. Um, the consent is obtained on usually on the website um, directly to the consumer um, with written information. Um, there's not really um, explanation given beyond the written um, explanation. Um, and then the results come directly to the consumer. Um, and usually they need to be confirmed before they can um, be used or applied clinically. So um, these are the differences between the main differences between the tests. And so looking um, at the methodologies, that's another way that we can distinguish between the different types of tests. And these are um, really, you can distinguish between um, the three uh, major categories. Um, according to the American College of Medical Genetics and Genomics and the Association of Molecular Pathology recommendations for their variant interpretation. So um, starting with the clinic-based genetic testing, um, this can be done either through single genes or gene panels. Um, either genome or exome sequencing can be ordered, chromosomal mi microarray, karyotyping. Um, we can look at pharmacogenomics or the effects of um, your genetic background on um, your ability to metabolize different medications. Um, also, you can review uh, methylation and trinucleotide copy number um, analysis. Um, in the consumer mediated or a consumer initiated provider mediated, um, these tend to rely more on gene panels um, and are usually not um, as um, extensive as what you can see in the clinic based genetic testing. Um, and um, also there's a can be a focus on pharmacogenomics. Now, in direct-to-consumer testing, however, it can be more limited. Um, we're looking more at primarily SNP-based testing or single nucleotide-based um, testing um, or genome sequencing. And again, there can be a focus on pharmacogenomics. Next slide. Hmm. That's interesting. There we go. Sorry okay. about that. Oh, no, you're fine. Um, and so as we talked about, ACMG and AMP, they have different consensus recommendations for variant interpretation. Um, as I said, only the um, direct con to consumer does not have recommendations for variant interpretation um, um, use in clinical um, or very limited, I should say. There's, I think there's only one or two cases. Um, in terms of the consensus um, recommendations for variant interpretation um, in direct to consumer, there are three different, um, or I'm sorry, five different types: um, pathogenic, likely likely pathogenic, variant of uncertain significance, likely benign, and benign. Now we use these consensus recommendations um, in both clinic-based and in the consumer mediated with um, provide or consumer ordered and provider mediated. But these categories and these consensus recommendations for variant interpretation um, are not used in direct-to-consumer genetic testing, as will be de demonstrated in um, case examples that we will be discussing um, later. So um, to help start with some of our cases, um, I'd like to introduce um, He Wan Lee um, for our next case. The next slide, please. For our first case presentation, so Hee Wan Lee is a genetic counselor and assistant professor. <laughs> 
Thank you so much, Dr. Park. So hello, everyone. My name is Huyen Lee. I use she, her pronouns. I'm really excited to talk about our first case. So in this first case, um, we have a 29-year-old young woman who uses she, her pronouns, and who's done direct-to-consumer testing and plans to start a family. Um, she has some concerns about two variants that were detected, and she has disclosed that she's adopted and has no biological family health history. Now, while DTC is not ideal um, in a clinical situation, this can be very meaningful. The direct-to-consumer testing can be very meaningful for many patients who are adopted, donor-conceived, or don't have access to their family health history. And so this test can be really sometimes the only connection that patients have to their biological family. And so adoptees in general don't have the bio-advantage of knowing generations of family health history and their risks for certain diseases. And so Many are turning to direct-to-consumer testing as a way to open the door um, and to get clues on their own health risks. Um, so this can be a conversation starter, a first step for a proactive patient. And additionally, um, if they have children or they're planning to have children, finding out any risk information for adoptees um, can be very helpful for future reproductive risks. Um, and so for this case in particular here, we've highlighted the variant that was found in the LDLR gene. Um, next slide, please. And so this is just a hypothetical example of what a direct-to-consumer test report might look like. And so I usually try to look at it in a couple of ways, like what are we seeing and what are we missing? So we're seeing here a short overview of hypercholesterolemia or FH um, and how it's associated with high cholesterol and risk for cardiovascular disease. And so we see that one variant is detected um, in the LDLR gene out of 24 different variants that the company tests for. And we can see in the bottom and fine print that we put on there that it it's just the LDLR gene is one of four genes. Um, but then we want to say, well, what are we missing? And so one thing a consumer might look at and think about is, well, you know, are the 24 variants in the LDLR gene um, only, or could they be in any other different gene? We can't really find that out by looking at this. Um, we are also missing the name, the exact name of the variant. And so we'd have to look for the fine print to get any information about it. A patient might even wonder as well, well, am I at risk for FH? Um, or is it okay just to have one variant? What if I had two or three or four? So it doesn't really contextualize what a one variant might be. And we know for FH, in many cases, it can be autosomal dominant. Um, and so having one variant could really be clinically actionable um, for disease risk. And then the report essentially is missing the next steps for consumers. So when a variant is detected in direct-to-consumer testing, it may or may not be clinically actionable. So Dr. Park uh, previously discussed how the direct-to-consumer testing standards and guidelines are very different than the clinical genetic testing with how the interpretation of a variant occurs. Um, but you know, when a patient brings in this information, especially with FH, we don't want to ignore you know, potentially clinically actionable information for that patient. Um, and their family members' health. Next slide, please. So now we're gonna actually ask you, what would you do? We really would love to have some audience engagement. And so I'm gonna read the question about some potential next steps, um, options for what this patient could do or what you would do as a provider. Um, and then I'll start the polling. So first is what would you do? And I'm gonna read through this. Um, disregard the results because it's not clinical grade testing. Order a fasting lipid profile. Order sequencing of the LDLR gene, order a gene panel for FH, order whole genome sequencing, and or consult with a genetics professional. And so if we could please launch the first poll, please choose all that you would apply. Great, we're getting some good results here. Thank you so much for participating. We're having over 50% of our audience is participating now. Looks like order a fasting lipid profile is, is in the lead here. Also order a gene panel for FH. Consult with a genetics professional. I love seeing that. We'll just I'll run this for maybe five more seconds. Wonderful. Okay, so let's wrap this up and I would love to um, be able to share um, the results with everyone. And you can also put in the Q&A your response and why you would you know, choose a few answers.
Great. So we can see here that the number one question or the number one answer or, or what you could do would be order fasting lipid. Then it looks like the next one is consult with a genetics professional. Um, and then we have a, a gene panel for FH. That's great. Okay, so thank you so much for participating in that. Um, next slide, please. Okay, so now I'm going to introduce and hand this over to Dr. Huria Ayubie. She's a clinical geneticist and medical educator at Texas Tech University Health Sciences Center at El Paso. Thank you. Hello, everybody. So, um, we started by figuring out why the patient pursued the diet crucible genetic testing and found out that it was really the lack of pers personal history and the, the, the fact that she wants to start a family is, is the reason that she pursued the, the direct consumer genetic testing. Um, next, we looked at the report and determined what are we seeing? And it indicated a risk for a genetic condition. Now, we need to determine if additional testing may be needed to confirm or refute the result. Um, and this may or may not be covered by uh, their health insurance. So in this case, um, a good starting point would be a lipid panel because it may, it, it's something that you can order as part of national guidelines and recommendations and would give you some uh, guidance as to whether or not um, the patient's um, variant um, is contributing to their elevated, uh, to ele to elevated cholesterol. The, Second step would be to consider clinical genetic testing, since um, this genetic test result could predispose to elevated cholesterol. And even in, in some individuals, actually, even if it, it is confirmed to be truly pathogenic, if it's confirmed that it is truly associated with elevated cholesterol, not everyone manifests elevated cholesterol. And we call that variable penetrance. Um, if she does not, um, demonstrate elevated cholesterol, it may have reproductive implications um, um, as they are planning to start a family. So let's assume her lipid panel came with elevated cholesterol, LDL more than 190. Um, the next step would be ideally to send um, genetic testing. Now, because um, as uh, Dr. Um, uh, Park talked about, and uh, our genetic counselor, um, he Wan talked about that um, the hy familial hypercholesterolemia and elevated cholesterol may be caused by pathogenic variants in different genes. I would choose to order uh, a gene panel um, because she had elevated cholesterol. Um, and this way it would be more informative. As for the family planning aspect of it, I would ideally want her to see a preconception genetic counselor or um, uh, a specialist who has some expertise in preconception genetic counseling um, so that she may be able to pursue clinical grade um, carrier um, a testing, genetic testing for being a carrier. Next slide, please. So here, her familial hypercholesterolemia panel came back with a pathogenic variant. And notice the difference here between this hypothetical uh, clinical grade report uh, versus the diet consumer genetic test report. Um, the report shows you the gene followed by where exactly the nucleic acid change is uh, and the exact annotation. Um, in the interpretation section, it tells you more about this genetic change, tells you more information about um, um, its frequency in the general population, whether there's been uh, any evidence to support it in the literature or not. Um, and here it is classified as pathogenic. Next slide, please. So with that, um, ideally for this patient, you would have, um, after ordering the lipid panel, 
you would order a, a, a jean panel because her lipid panel was elevated. Now, had her lipid panel been not elevated uh, with elevated cholesterol, maybe I would just send for the LDLR gene, um, given that it is unlikely to be covered by insurance and this way there would be less of a cost incurred by the patient. Um, and um, while a geneticist or a genetic counselor would be helpful to, to walk you through these results, but being the only genetics professional in El Paso, Texas, I don't think it's feasible for every patient who pursues diet consumer genetic testing to be evaluated by a genetics professional. And with that, we'll open it up for questions. We do have one question um, uh, on what happens when a patient cannot pay for the test. Um, Haria, do you want to take that one? Um, so, for if you're trying to order a clinical grade genetic testing, um, ideally, you would try to go through the patient's insurance um, in order to. Um, and this is where it becomes a problem when it's a consumer genetic test result without um, any accompanying um, alteration. However, if the patient has uh, elevated LDL cholesterol, then ideally insurance would cover that test result. Now, uh, laboratories that offer clinical grade genetic testing also offer payment plans for patients um, who are. Um, who really want to proceed with the genetic testing. That being said, it's a conversation to have with your patient um, whether or not paying out of pocket um, is, is reasonable for them or not, and um, whether not pursuing genetic testing would be an option as well. And here, you know, with elevated cholesterol, many people have elevated cholesterol, and you will send genetic testing for every single person. So potentially you might if the patient is unable to afford the, the testing, um, you might not send it based on that conversation that you're gonna have with your patient. I think we've answered all of the lot of questions. Oh, hold on, one more, one more just came in. Um, do you routinely recommend DTC genetic testing for patients who have no family history info available? He won. Do you want to take that one? Yeah, that's a great question. So I think routinely, you know, it really depends on a person's personal history, if they have any conditions that might warrant genetic testing or other preventative health um, measures. Um, sometimes when patients would come to see me, I was in cancer um, and they didn't have a family health history, we would order usually a larger panel, but there's a lot of considerations um, to, to think about, you know, if people, how much information the person wants, how much they're comfortable with, if they have biological children or wanting biological children. Um, sometimes people would come for um, gender affirming care and they had no family history. They wanted to know if they carried, you know, a BRCA or other high risk variant. Um, so there are definitely situations where I think genetic counselors and other genetics professionals um, are willing to consider, you know, genetic testing. Um, but if someone is very healthy and they don't have, you know, any personal histories, then, you know, it really warrants a larger conversation to figure out what's the right path, what makes sense, what's covered, what isn't, um, and then go through the informed consent process to make sure the patient um, is very comfortable with that. Thanks. Thanks, everyone. I think we've answered all of the live questions, so we can move on. Thank you, um, Hemon. Um, I, I would agree with you. I wouldn't particularly recommend bird consumer genetic testing because, again, it only tests for select variants, um, and if they are concerned about um, a cancer risk or other, you would want a more comprehensive test that, um, that is clinical grade rather than direct consumer. Uh, but an alternative may be um, um, consumer initiated, physician mediated. With that, we are going to move on to the pharmacogenomics aspect of this case because we are going to start um, medications for our patient. And as it happens, your direct consumer genetic test also includes pharmacogenomic test results. And um, our clinical uh, pharmacists with expertise 
with pharmacogenomics, Dr. Roseanne Gamal is going to uh, present the next section. Thank you so much, Dr. UVA. Um, as she said, my name is Roseanne Gamel, and I'm an Associate Professor of Pharmacy Practice at Massachusetts College of Pharmacy and Health Sciences in Boston. Um, and so in this section, you will know, we'll talk about the pharmacogenomics. So again, pharmacogenomics is a field of study that lies at the intersection of pharmacology and genomics, and it's all about how our genes influence medication response. Next slide, please. So we're still with the same patient as we were in the first part of the case, um, but now we're going to focus on the pharmacogenomic aspects of her direct-to-consumer uh, genetic testing. In particular, there was a variant detected in a gene called SLCL1B1, which relates to statin medications that are used to treat high cholesterol. Next slide, please. So in this case, um, as you know, we've already discussed, it, it's recommended, you know, and this best practice would have been to have ordered a lipid panel for this patient. And so let's say we did this for her and we see that her LDL cholesterol is, is very elevated at 320 milligrams per deciliter. And if we go to the current clinical guidelines for the treatment of high cholesterol, we see there's a recommendation to pursue high intensity statin therapy in order to bring that level down and reduce her overall cardiovascular risk. And so the question at hand is, which the patient may very well have, is, you know, will the genetic test results impact my treatment in any way? Next slide, please. So if we take a closer look at her direct-to-consumer pharmacogenomic test report, uh, what you may see is a table that, that may look like this that contains uh, several genes um, that relate to medication response. You know, oftentimes these genes relate to, to specific uh, medications are certainly not relevant for all medications. Um, but you also see that there is an indication of what variants may be detected in these genes and what those variants mean for the overall protein function uh, for, those, for those different proteins um, that are encoded by those genes. And again, focusing on that last gene result there, SLCO1B1, we see that uh, the patient does carry a variant uh, in that gene that does have an impact on that protein function. Specifically, it results in a decreased function of that protein. So we'll go to the next slide, please, and we'll, we'll look at, well, how does this gene and, and this, this protein that's encoded by the SLCO1B1 gene relate to statins? Um, so I'll direct your attention first to the left side of the screen, um, where we're looking at a situation where there's no variance in the SLCO1B1 gene, and we have a normal functioning protein. The protein in this case is what we call a drug transporter, uh, which is responsible for um, basically think of it as, as a door um, that, that opens and allows uh, the statin medication to travel from the bloodstream into the liver. And it's in the liver where that medication will be broken down and cleared from the body. So again, on the left-hand side, if we have a situation where there's, uh, there's no variance in that gene, that gene is working properly, we have an SLCO1B1 transporter that's working well, and that can readily transport, again, those statin medications from the blood to the liver where it can be broken down and cleared from the body. Now, if we direct our attention to the right-hand side, we have the case that uh, where we see our patient is presenting uh, in that she has a variant in one of her copies of the SLCO1B1 gene. So what does that mean for her? Well, that means that SLCO1B1 transporter is not working as well. Um, and in this case, we go with the door analogy. You think about it, the door is kind of just slightly open, not fully open, uh, just a little bit open. So it allows some statin medication to go through, but not as readily uh, as a normal functioning protein would. And the clinical consequence of that is that you can have a buildup of that statin medication in the bloodstream. And if that concentration gets too high, it can lead to adverse effects. And notably with the statin medications, the adverse effect that we're concerned with is, is muscle pains and weakness, uh, something called myopathy, uh, which we may see with statin therapy. So this specific variant and SLCO1B1 um, can lead to a higher risk of statin-associated myopathy in patients. We'll go to the next slide, please. Um, and at this time, I'm going to hand it over to my colleague, Dr. Christine Formia, who's a, also a clinical pharmacist who specializes in pharmacogenomics. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Dr. Gamble. Appreciate that. 
now that uh, Dr. Gamble has covered the important information about the, um, the patient case, we're going to go into another patient, uh, into another question. So what is the next best step for the clinician to take? One, disregard all of the direct-to-consumer pharmacogenomic test results. Two, use all of the direct-to-consumer pharmacogenomic test results to guide prescribing. Three, determine whether the direct-to-consumer pharmacogenomic test is FDA cleared for clinical use. Or four, order confirmatory clinical testing from a CLIA certified lab. Would you please launch the poll, please? Is the polling launched? Oh, thank you, very good. All right, I'm gonna give it a few uh, seconds here for you all to participate in the polling. Okay, it looks like we've got two big contenders here. Number three and number four. And we have about 60% participation. Thank you. Maybe just a couple more seconds here. Okay, great. We have I'm going to close it here in about two more seconds. All right, thank you. Well, what we see here is the, um, we're gonna share the results. And the, it looks like from our polling question, we had a very neck and neck response selecting number three and four from our, um, our participants today. Thank you, let's close that poll. Appreciate that. And next slide, please. The answer that we're looking for for the next best step for the clinician is number three, to determine whether the direct-to-consumer pharmacogenomic test is FDA cleared for clinical use. And this is important because this has really been, over the past few years, this has really been changing up. So. Um, where were we? Where we were at a few years ago would have been number four, but where we're at today, this has changed up. And let's we'll talk a little bit more about this in this next section. Next slide, please. So as I said, this things have changed in the recent um, recent times, and what where we are today is that direct to consumer genetic tests, including pharmacogenomic tests typically require confirmatory clinical testing prior to use in medical decision-making. Like I said, this is changing. The environment and the landscape keeps changing up here. We have two important exceptions at this time. The first is 23andMe CYP2C19 test results, for, um, which are paired with clopidogrel and citalopram on patient reports, can be used clinically now. And the Second key exception is 23andMe's SLCO1B1 test, um, which is paired with simvastatin on the patient reports. This is the second exception. So these two are the only two tests for pharmacogenomics directed consumer testing that can be used for medical decision making currently. Now, the next point to know is that the clinical significance of the pharmacogenomic variants detected on these directed consumer tests. Um, can be researched using evidence-based resources. And the first resource is CPIC, or the Clinical Pharmacogenetics Implementation Consortium. Now, CPIC is an international group that supports implementation of pharmacogenomic tests through evidence-based peer-reviewed guidelines. The second example, next, thank you, is PharmGKB. This stands for the Pharmacogenetics Knowledge Base. It is a publicly available and comprehensive resource that contains extensive knowledge about um, drug and gene information, and it's particularly helpful for healthcare providers and researchers. Next, please. And the third available resource is FDA, or Food and Drug Administration's, tables for pharmacogenomics. The first is a table for pharmacogenomic biomarkers, and the second is a table for drug gene associations. 
Now, all three of these resources are freely accessible to the public. They're, um, you know, use these great, um, these uh, web access uh, websites to find more information um, and they're freely available on the internet uh, to use for patient care. Next slide, please. Great. Now that we've now that we've gone through that important information, we have verified, in fact, that the patient's direct-to-consumer pharmacogenomic test results are from 23andMe. So we know that we can document the two FDA cleared results on the patient's report. Remember, that's the CYP2C19 and the SLCO1B1 results, and we can put them into the patient's chart in the electronic health record. Now, now that we have that portion, um, we know this, we can go through and use the CPIC guidelines for th therapeutic care for the patient. As we recall, the patient had a very elevated cholesterol level. The LDL was 320 milligrams per deciliter and they need high intensity, so some very intense therapy to bring down that cholesterol level. So we're gonna focus on the left side of this algorithm and as we move down the algorithm, we can see that there's increasing risk for that myopathy, that muscle pain and weakness and aching that can happen with, um, with using increased doses and being very intense with that therapy um, for this patient. Next slide, please. And with that, we'd be happy to answer questions in the chat. Thank you. And actually, just to clarify the questions, put your questions in the Q&A. Oh, yes, thank you. So a couple questions are coming up. And the first one is, what would the normal doses be? Christine, can you answer that one? I don't have the, the numbers right here. I would be using the medication doses that are listed in the drug and the drug labeling at this point. Um, it, that would be the starting point. These would be um, the higher doses for this particular patient case. Rose, would you be able to have, do you have additional information for the question? Yeah, I'll just add that there's this different standard doses that associate with the different intensities of statins. So you can see some examples there of what are the doses for what's a low intensity statin regimen versus moderate and high intensity. And this is a figure that we're showing from the CPIC guideline for statins um, that shows um, the different intensity statins with the doses and then categorized based on the risk for that statin associated myopathy based on that decreased function result. Um, and so this gives you an idea of, of what those doses are here. Okay, we have another question um, about some other genes that impact um, statins. So would you also consider ABCG2 and CYP2C9? That's a great question. Um, and, and you're right that there are those other genes relate to other statins, specifically ABCG2 relates to rosuvastatin and CYP2C9 relates to fluvastatin. And CPIC provides guidelines for the interpretation of those results and use of those results to guide those specific statin therapies. In the case of direct-to-consumer pharmacogenomic testing, at this time, those genes are not included on direct-to-consumer testing. And so we really just have the SLCO1B1 results to go off of. But certainly if the patient has had clinical pharmacogenomic testing and has those results, then we can certainly include them as part of our decision-making process. And following up on that, there's another question. Do you know of any other uh, any genes that are um, being considered to be added to um, the clinically cleared list? I'm not aware of any that are uh, particular, you know, queued up at this time. So, um, but perhaps Dr. Gamel um, is aware. 
So uh, 23 and Me has been FDA cleared to return, I think it's eight total genes um, as part of their panel. Currently, they're just returning um, three genes, and two of those three genes are clinically cleared. So I'm not aware of like kind of what's up next for kind of clinical clearance for, for use in, in medical practice directly, um, but know that there are other genes that 23andMe has been cleared for generally to return back. They just haven't done so at the present time presumably in the near future. Okay, and there's another, um, someone's asking for some clarification, uh, primarily about the previous one, but I think it relates to this as well. Are you saying that commercial test results from companies like um, OneOme and GeneSight need to be retested by an FDA cleared lab? So, so no. Um, so one ohm and gene site um, don't offer direct to consumer genetic testing in the truest sense. In that, you know, when we we there was a slide and um, but which outlined the different models. And so, um, it is possible for a, a consumer to to go through the consumer initiated provider mediated testing. So, for example, go on the one ohm website as a consumer, say I want to do pharmacogenomic testing, and then they employ physicians who then sign off on those results. Those are Considered clinical results that can be used directly. Um, so what we're talking about here is a true kind of direct to consumer with no healthcare professional involved, no healthcare professional ordering these tests. Um, and so in, in that case, that's when there could potentially be the need for confirmatory testing if there's not specific FDA clearance for it. Uh, but the other models, you know, whether ordered through a healthcare provider directly or if a patient initiates to the company and they have a healthcare provider that signs off on the test, those are all considered, you know, clinical grade testing that can be used directly without confirmatory testing. We have a question um, that's asking about algor. How many algorithms are there? Did you say there were only two? And I don't have the more context for that question. Okay, so there. In terms of the algorithm that we were following, could you go back one slide, please? Great. Yes. Thank you. So this particular algorithm is provided within the CPIC guidelines. And this is with information about SLCO1B1. But there are, um, as we heard, there was a question about um, adding when there's clinical information, clinical testing, FDA um, pro, you know, approved laboratory testing results available, we have some other genetic variables that can be considered. So there are additional algorithms that can be incorporated with this genetic and medication information. With this particular algorithm, we are only looking at SLCO1B1 and that in the high intensity statin therapy on the left hand side. So, again, this is in the context of our direct to consumer pharmacogenomic test results and what we've talked about with this particular patient case, focusing on this piece of the algorithm for what we have and what is FDA cleared to use for this patient's care. And also to clarify that this is a decreased function variant in SLCO1B1. Very important. Thank you so much, Dr. Weiler. And then the next question about the, the next steps is what are the clinical steps that are done to decide the management once a pharmacogenetic variant is detected? Yeah, so um, once you know what the variant is, um, again, first step is to you ask yourself, can you use this clinically? Is this FDA cleared? And we went over those you know, specific examples here. So once you know it's cleared for use, uh, we recommend going to those evidence-based sources for guidance, uh, namely the Clinical Pharmacogenetics Implementation Consortium, the website's there for your reference, cpicpgx.org. There is a list of those uh, peer-reviewed evidence-based guidelines. They're freely available, and they are designed to um, tell clinicians or, and help them understand how do you interpret these genetic test results and what do they mean for medication therapy? Does that mean a change in dose? Does that mean a change in drug therapy? Does that mean we can use the standard dose? 
um, when we're when we're looking at these different medications. So CPIC is kind of a great resource to start with. And as also was mentioned, um, US FDA uh, has um, in pharmacogenomics guidance and some of some labels of some medications as well. And so they may have some additional information that would be helpful for clinical care. Um, and that middle resource, PharmGKB, that's kind of like a clearinghouse for all of this information. So if you really didn't know what to start, you could search PharmGKB for the gene of interest and medication of interest, and they would pull in what are those available resources and guidelines that can help you answer that clinical question. To add to that, um, when you want to choose a genetic testing uh, company, one resource that I like to use is the Genetic Testing Registry uh, by the National Institute of Health, which is a central location for voluntary submission of genetic information by laboratories, and they include the test purpose, methodology, validity, usefulness and laboratory contacts. And that would enable you to order clinical grade pharmacogenomic test for your patient. Um, to confirm um, any direct consumer, direct consumer pharmacogenomic results um, outside of what we talked about, outside the exceptions that we talked about. And even I'll just add too, even if you have a clinical um, result back from direct to consumer testing, like the SLCA1B1 result, note that other clinical tests may test for additional variants that were not included on the direct to consumer test. And so it is possible to get additional information back um, from a different test, again, depending on what variants were covered compared to the ones that were covered on the direct to consumer testing. Okay, there were some questions about um, links. Um, there are some are on that slide. And another question came up about, um, so what percent of the 23andMe report is now FDA approved? Whether it's all of it, 10%, 30%, um, does the 23andMe report state which variants are FDA approved? That's a good question. And this is just in general, I believe, not just for uh, pharmacogenetics. So I can speak to the, the pharmacogenomics piece of it. Again, I think there's eight genes that are FDA cleared, you know, for, for 23andMe to report back. Currently, they're reporting back three genes, and two of those three genes no longer require confirmatory clinical testing for use. Um, so that's the pharmacogenomics piece of it. I'm not sure if someone else on the panel might be able to speak to. Actually, I, as far as I know, I don't think anything else um, it can be used directly clinically, but yes, I'll defer to my colleagues on the panel uh, for that information. So, so the, the FDA, um, they, they have received marketing authorization by the FDA um, for accuracy, reliability, and con consumer comprehension, but you cannot use them clinically without conformatory clinical genetic testing. And um, that's, and you're going to see that on the report too. Um, with the exception of the pharmacogenomic variants um, as they pertain to the medications that Dr. Gamel and um, Dr. Formia talked about. That being said, there are other direct consumer genetic companies that are offering um, additional um, results. Again, um, you need to confirm those results through a clinical laboratory before you act on them. Um, and there is a there is a difference between, um, um, and this might change with time, but at present time, um, these reports from direct consumer genetic testing companies typically have a, a, a sentence or two saying, please talk to your healthcare professional before implementing any changes um, in your medications or um, any, um, taking any new medications or lifestyle changes based on these results. And in speaking of direct-to-consumer genetic testing more broadly, I would say that um, you need to be cautious as healthcare providers and as consumers in terms of the um, way, as we said, that the variants are not reported um, according to the, con to the consensus recommendations. 
And um, frequently they are testing a very small proportion of variants. Um, and there are there can be hundreds um, of variants that are associated, but they may only be testing three. And so that's not helpful for you um, as a healthcare provider or you as a consumer to definitively be able to say anything clinically about reports from direct-to-consumer genetic testing, especially um, when they're not um, clinically validated. <clears throat> So another really great point just came up in the Q&A, and this is about um, how understandable the language is of the reports for, um, for general physicians. So the question is, are DTC pharmacogenetic lab reports typically written at the level of understanding to family medicine physicians due to, as we all know, limited genetics professional access? I would think patients would discuss these results with primary care physicians before they are referred to genetics professionals. And that is absolutely true. And that's a key reason of having this session. So would somebody like to address that specifically for the DTC pharmacogenetic lab reports, Roseanne or Christine? Sure, I'll take a, I'll take a swing at that one. Um, the, most of the results are, if they're direct to consumer, the information that's there is geared towards the patient. It's, these are um, readily accessible and that language is very, um, accessible for uh, general consumers. However, when we start talking about clinical grade pharmacogenomic testing, though, because those tests are typically ordered by healthcare providers, such as family medicine, um, healthcare uh, providers, genetic counselors, there's a higher level of um, discussion based on the genetics and the medication interactions, and they are at a higher um, uh, level of understanding and it can be, uh, and the reason for that is because these tests are being ordered by medical providers. So it's um, a higher level of, um, of language and um, expected um, understanding and inter interpretations. And it's expected that the healthcare provider will take that information and then translate that and share that in those discussions with the patients that they're um, interp interpreting the results for and interpreting those, um, those key genetic variants and those implications for medications with the patients. So there is a difference there between the two different types of testing. And it's also important to know that the healthcare providers getting that understanding is important using those um, third part, those uh, resources we shared earlier to get a good understanding of some of those va genetic variants that are out there to be able to share that at a patient um, appropriate level with um, patients and their with their result delivery. So Dr. Formia, you're, you're suggesting that the, some of the reports might be at a higher level and you're um, referring folks to like primary care physicians to the resources to really have a better understanding of how to interpret the results that are in a report. Um, I'm, uh, particularly focusing on the clinical grades. So some of those, when we have confirmatory testing, does that make sense? Those, the laboratory where the provide, patients go to the providers, remember we talked about the, this uh, doctor, um, doctor, um, I think we talked about this earlier in the slide, Dr. Uh, Park uh, showed us where we have those um, situations where patients go to the providers and the providers, healthcare providers, order those clinical grade tests. Those are the ones that are going to be at a higher level because the provider's involved and they're ordering them. We, we're talking more specifically about direct-to-consumer, that is going to be more general, and I think that's at the level that can be understood by uh, a general audience, and that's uh, what FDA has um, set forth as having um, ac general accessibility to that information um, for direct-to-consumer, is my understanding. Thank you, and just to follow up with what, as was said before, that sometimes the, the direct-to-consumer um, reports, while they may be, you know, a more understandable, they also do not, they're also lacking a lot of information. They don't provide everything. So to keep that in mind. Um, and there's a question, could you comment on the high frequency of false positives in direct-to-consumer testing in general? Um, yeah, I can, yeah. I can hop in on that. Um, so in general, 
a lot of the research that's done on some of these false positives with direct-to-consumer testing is really talking about third-party interpretation of services. So a consumer would do a direct-to-consumer test, download their raw data, and then upload it to a third-party interpretation service. And there are a few studies out there that's saying up to 40% um, is pretty high level. So uh, a variance or actually a false positive. So sometimes I've seen patients come in with a, like 80 pages um, from their third party interpretation um, and saying, oh my gosh, I have so many variants that I'm at risk for. And so what we first have to do is really talk about the education of that and saying, you know, a lot of the times um, those third party interpretations are, are incorrect because they're using different standards and guidelines than even the direct to consumer testing um, and then compared to clinical grade. So we'll kind of go over and talk about so maybe some of the highest points, take a look at it. If we do have family health history, try to contextualize it. And if the patient is willing, then have a discussion about clinical grade genetic testing to really try to confirm um, and kind of, you know, assuage those doubts and, and worries. Um, another thing, I think a question was talking about um, costs associated with DTC. Um, in general, they can be more affordable than some of the clinical grade genetic testing. Um, I don't have a, you know, a ballpark. I'm coming from the cancer world. I'm thinking, you know, two to 300. Um, but also there are some clinical grade genetic testing that can be very affordable depending on income. Um, and equity is definitely, you know, something that we talk about. Um, sometimes people will say, well, it was really a lot easier for me to just go to a store and get this test and then start this process than try to wait and get to see a genetic counselor, et cetera. So you definitely can understand that it can provide some access. But again, we always say with that caveat that, you know, it's not as comprehensive. It's only looking at this much of a gene. It's really not being applied with the same standards as clinical genetic testing. So again, great first step, good for a proactive patient, um, but definitely would want to have that discussion with a with a genetics professional to talk about comprehensive testing. Um, and Kimon, can you also add to that, that the question that also asked about health equity? Yes, so, yes, yes. When I was talking about access, yes. Yeah, so I think, yeah, some of that um because it can be cheaper than clinical grade testing, it, it is definitely more, you know, accessible and affordable. Um, but it, uh, it's really important to sort of have your patient or have people sort of weigh the costs and benefits. Like, do they know what they're signing up to? Um, you know, they may not want to have the biological relative um, connection there. They may, that might open too many doors. For their health thing, they may think, hey, great, I don't have a BRCA variant. I'm not going to get breast cancer. But we know with many tests, it's only looking at just a few variants and it's not looking, you know, comprehensively at the gene. So yes, there's some health equity there um, as far as access and affordability, but I would argue that that is at a cost at, at really not getting a fuller picture, which might enrich and help a patient down the line gain some more, you know, access to, to preventative treatments, which would be another, you know, health equity um, issue. I, I would agree with you. Um... Um, he won. You know, it's it's important to remember that here our our cases had positive results and or a variant that was detected, and we figured out what the result meant um, and whether or not we should proceed with confirmatory genetic testing, clinical gene clinical grade genetic testing. But the result could come back negative, right? Or say after or undetected which may be a true negative, but it could also be a false negative or an uninformative result uh, because art consumer genetic testing is not comprehensive and is limited a finite number of variants for specific conditions, carrier risk, um, or pharmacogenomic tests. So this could result in false reassurance. And in fact, individual could be at risk for um, a genetic condition, a carrier risk uh, that they could pass on to their offspring or a suboptimal medication response. Um, with that, um, direct to consume, um, you know, clinical grade genetic testing um, that is ordered by a healthcare professional uh, typically um, would almost always would provide you access to a genetic counselor or other genetic specialist who could help you with um, not only ordering um, a, a test, but interpreting the results if you don't have adequate expertise with genetic testing. Um, alternatively, um, you know, consumer-initiated, physician-mediated can be um, an, a, a um, 
uh, uh, an affordable avenue for some patients. Um, that being said, unfortunately, um, we do see discrepancy in genetic testing, um, in referral to genetics in general, um, with underrepresented individuals not being as well represented in our genetics clinics. And, and um, that applies to, you know, as it would be expected with healthcare. And, um, and that's something that we all strive to improve on um, and would want access to all. So there are a couple questions that I think are, are um, somewhat related. Um, and so maybe a couple of you might want to chime in on this. So the first is, do you have a sense for how many clinicians are using this data? And then um, how often do you see primary care physicians ordering more specifically PGX tests, pharmacogenetics tests? And my experience is that they don't want to due to lack of understanding. So how many clinicians are actually using the data and particularly for pharmacogenetics, how often are they um, are they ordering it? I don't have good numbers. Um, Hiwan, do you have any experience? I mean, I think from a genetic counseling perspective, if I've seen it used in the prenatal and the cancer setting, I'm sure in other settings as well. Um, if a patient brings in their direct to consumer testing and they say, you know, I have this variant, I have concerns about it, we often have a discussion, you know, um, of how accurate is it, to, you know, most likely we confirm it with genetic testing, we ask about family health history, if there is any, um, and sometimes there are a few of those um, consumer initiated provider, you know, physician mediated um, tests that people can bring in and we say, okay, that's great. You know, we don't have to retest you on this. This looks like a real variant, but that's, that's pretty, that's probably more uncommon, um, but we definitely take them seriously. Um, I know sometimes providers will say, oh gosh, I don't know what to do with this or, but I always want to reframe the situation and say, this is a great first step. It is opening the door. It is a conversation starter. That patient is interested and engaged and proactive. And so even even though if this might not be the right test or it might be in the direction that, you know, isn't appropriate for them, we can still talk with them and see what their, you know, interests, fears, hopes are with this testing and this health information. And um, Kathy, so I um, deployed a study or a survey to PAs in a nationwide survey, mm -hmm. and I would say that 25 to 30 percent of PAs had um, had patients who came to them with direct consumer genetic testing mm -hmm. um, with questions. Um, and so um, patients are coming to clinicians for this. Um, also, um, a program that's going on in the VA is called the Phaser program, um, which is related to um, precision oncology and more um, pharmacogenomics within the VA. So there are more providers within the, the VA that are being encouraged to order um, pharmacogenomic testing and to use it um, in um, a clinical setting. Um, but in general, I think the feeling um, and part of the reason why probably a lot of people are attending our um, session today is because a lot of people have questions about um, direct-to-consumer genetic testing and how it can impact on um, as people have said, both um, how do we care for our patients, but also how it impacts on health equity. And then from a pharmacogenomic standpoint, I think, um, you know, due to the, you know, relative lack of education really in pharmacogenomics among primary care physicians, we, we really don't see it yet as standard of care in many primary care practices. Um, that being said, there are some centers across the country that have um, implementation projects. They're leading in the implementation of pharmacogenomics, and they have robust uh, educational efforts to help get their physicians up to speed with testing, and that often makes them more comfortable and more apt to be ordering testing or being more comfortable with the results. Um, but yeah, this, this issue of education is a big reason why we're all here today, why we're having this Healthcare Professionals Genomics Education Week, uh, because this technology exists, these tests exist, they have the potential to really help with improve patient care, and we need to make sure we're getting our healthcare professionals up to speed uh, with the latest science so that we can help optimize uh, patient outcomes. So education really is key uh, to all of this. And I would agree with everything that Dr. Gamble said. Um, additionally, keeping in mind that the landscape is changing with these direct-to-consumer pharmacogenomic uh, test results. And over time, we have gone from absolutely none 
um, no um, genetic variants could be um, were uh, FDA cleared to a slow changing. Now we have two um, two particular genes that can be used, and we talked about those today. So again, just being aware that as as time changes, as we're moving, um, so is so is the target. So just. Um, to also keep that in mind as well, to communicate with other healthcare professionals and keep asking questions and joining in with groups like this to learn um, what's new and um, best for a patient, uh, applying to patient care. And for those of you interested in learning more about pharmacogenomics and educational offerings, we do have a pharmacogenomics day as part of this week um, tomorrow, and there are several sessions it's all focused on pharmacogenomics, including one that uh, we're going to be talking about a new uh, pharmacogenomics learning series for healthcare professionals that's going to be um, free to, to everyone and, and, and offered for CE credit as well uh, for a small fee um, if for the credit. Um, but yes, it'll be, be available for anyone interested to learn more about pharmacogenomics. So if you're interested, feel free to check out the sessions tomorrow as well. Thank you so much, Dr. Gamble, Dr. Formia, and, and thank you for all the work you're doing this on this you know, education work that you're doing to help out physicians. This is really fantastic. And I just want to note that it is five after the hour, and we are um, all willing to, to hang out and then answer more questions. So if you'd like to, to stay with us, um, Tracy, do you want to say anything about the time or should I just keep going with questions for right now? Keep going with questions. Okay. <laughs> okay. So you're all welcome to, to stay with us if you have the time to stay and we'll um, have a bit more of a discussion. So then um, someone is bringing up a really important point, kind of coming back to the, to the health equity issue. And so um, this attendee is saying that one could argue that the provider initiated physician ordered testing approach actually improves health equity. These tests are moderate in terms of cost around $300, and they don't require an office visit, which is helpful for patients who live in rural settings or have disabilities that impact mobility. On the flip side, they tend to be accessed more by individuals with relatively higher education and familiarity with these types of tests. And I'll also point out that while $300 is less expensive than a lot of other tests, this is not covered by insurance and many other tests are covered by insurance. So when we talk about health equity, I would argue that this is not very accessible for, um, for many folks. So we have to keep that in mind too. But would others like to, to chime in and, and say something about this? I would agree that um, the consumer mediated um, or consumer initiated provider mediated um, is more accessible in one respect and less in another. Um, we really, you know, and, and really, I think partly the accessibility is an issue of, of do we even know it exists, right? For so many folks, they don't even recognize that this is an option for them. Um, so it's partly an education thing. Um, you know, and the more knowledge we can convey uh, to both providers as well as their patients, um, the the better off everybody's going to be about uh, in that respect. I would also argue that sometimes there can be language accessibility issues when it comes to um, these um, provider initiated and and. Um, sorry, uh, consumer initiated um, and provider mediated tests, um, because sometimes, um, you know, first there's the education piece, but then also the ability to, to um, communicate the results in a way that makes sense um, culturally, I think is a piece that it's more helpful to have um, when you have um, genetic counselors and genetic professionals within the community themselves that um, those, that's a much better option. Yeah, I would I would like to add on to that too. I think um, those are all great points, um, and especially the point about having an interpreter or having language services for the letter and for the cons you know the consult. Um, additionally, the cascade testing, which we know is really important for our case with FH, but for many cases, um, if it's something that can be passed down to to biological children, it's really important to have that discussion um, between a provider um, and a patient to say, okay, like, do you have any biological children or what siblings or what your family. 
Um, how do you think they would feel? Let's provide a letter. Let's get that letter translated into these different languages for you. Um, so those are all ways of, of access and equity that we can, as providers, help out in. And I think something that you know maybe hasn't been addressed particularly is there are a lot of psychosocial concerns um, that can occur during you know any kind of testing, but with genetic testing um, and trying to really figure out one's risk um, as well as communicating it to others and your support people. And you know even for people who are doing direct to consumer testing, if they do the kind where they find biological family, that can also um, have a lot of impact um, emotionally and psychosocially that they bring to you as the provider um, that has to deal with a whole landscape of, of things. Um, so we want to really support and educate people that if you're going to be doing, you know, direct-to-consumer testing um, and, and clinical genetic testing as well, that, you know, to have really good support from your provider and others. Thank you, Hewan. Before we finish, um, there's a couple of, uh, there's some summary points here that we would like to make um, to kind of close out the session. And I think Dr. Ayubia is, is going to present this. Can you hear me well? I know yes. I've had some microphone issues. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, you know, uh, wrap up, rem recognize that there is a difference between direct consumer, consumer initiated, uh, physician mediated or provider mediated and clinical genetic testing. Um, and that only clinical genetic testing, consumer initiated, physician mediated, direct consumer genetic testing um, can be used right away for clinical decision making, except for the only exception, uh, which the only exception is the pharmacogenomic BTCGT result that has FDA 510 clearance, um, which is the CYP2C19 or clopidogrelin citalopram for 23andMe and SLCO1B1 for some statin test result. Um, now, when a patient is interested in pursuing direct consumer genetic testing or have pursued direct consumer genetic testing, figure out why they um, or why they want to pursue the test. Are there any underlying health concerns, any personal, family, or medication history that clinical grade genetic testing is warranted? Um, recognize that individuals with limited family history uh, may be interested in uh, genetic testing to understand their health predispositions. Um, when reviewing the DTCGT report, um, Determine what are you looking at and um, recognize that there are limitations to the test and there are limitations of the report that is issued by the direct consumer genetic testing company. Um, additionally, patients may use their raw data, put it in third party analysis, interpretation services, and those reports may yield false positive results. If you have a direct consumer genetic test report in front of you and a variant is detected, uh, the result is positive. Um, look it up, find out what does this mean? Does this mean it's a risk for a genetic condition? Could they pass this on to their offspring? Is this a pharmacogenomic result? And determine whether or not confirmatory clinical genetic testing is um, warranted um, and discuss with the patient how they would like to proceed uh, and whether or not um, 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 the, understand that there, this could may not be covered by their health insurance. Um, that being said, um, any genetic test result is, um, uh, is considered um, private information, cannot be accessed, it, it's covered by the Genetic Information and Discrimination Act. It cannot be accessed by employers, except for um, certain, um, for the federal government, um, military, um, and health insurance cannot discriminate against you. But if you, um, if you were to take out a life insurance, a disability, or a long-term policy, they can look at your genetic test results. Um, that's why when you proceed with uh, genetic testing, um, it's useful to have a conversation with a, a, a professional with expertise in genetics uh, to talk about all of those different aspects. That being said, um, we, we're still here to answer questions and we really appreciate your feedback about the session.
If there are no more questions in the Q&A, we thank you for attending today. We are very appreciative of your interest in direct-to-consumer genetic testing and how it applies to clinical care because it's not, it's not an easy thing. There's some complexity there. So thank you. And um, we really encourage your feedback on the, with the QR code. <clears throat> And please attend more events this week for lots more wonderful information about, um, about medical genetics and genomics. And stay tuned tomorrow for more info about the pharmacogenomics. You can go to the, um, the genome.gov website and look for all of the, the uh, relevant um, healthcare professionals, genomics education week um, offerings are listed there. Okay, thank you very much.